Ah, so good of you to have joined me once again on this Monday. Well, it's a beautiful evening for a campfire, isn't it? So, why don't you join me? Come on, come in a little bit closer, that's it. I've got a story to tell you, and it's one hell of a story this evening. Now, I don't know if you use Airbnb, but I don't. And I have to say, it's stories like the one I've got to tell you right now that make me such a pessimist. But anyway, you make sure you draw in just that little bit closer, because I've got a story to tell you. And it goes something like this. Buckle up, boys and girls. My buddy and I just experienced some grade A creepy shit while on a trip to Red Rocks in Colorado. I write a lot of things down anyway, and so I figured I might as well post the story here and see what you guys think. So, who here has used Airbnb? <laughs> Raise his hand. I think I've used it no less than 20 times. All great experience up until this point. Seriously. Well, I need to go ahead and preface this by saying that, while I could send you a link to this house, it wouldn't do any good, because it's not there anymore. But we'll get to that later. I'm guessing since you're reading this, you're probably a bit like me. A big reader, kind of weird, generally a fan of being scared. More power to you. My buddy, we'll call him John, is the same way. So, a few weeks ago, John and I saw that one of our favorite bands was going to be playing at Red Rocks. We've been talking about making a trip up there for years now. We live in Florida. And the timing seemed perfect. Both of our wives are pregnant. And the thought process was that if we're going to make a trip like this, it was now or never. The drive was going to take about 24 hours. So we decided we would drive until about midnight after we got off work, find a place to crash, and finish the drive the next day. I immediately hopped onto Airbnb and started looking for somewhere cool to stay. Now, remember what I said earlier about being into the slightly creepy? Well, I'm scrolling through potential places to see in Tennessee, since it's about eight hours from Tampa, where we live. I come across this majestic, plantation-style house in some place called Sequatchie, Tennessee. The pictures look amazing, and it only costs $30 a night to stay there. <laughs> $30 gets you the upstairs suite, complete with its own bathroom. You can tell that it sits on a tall hill in the woods, overlooking a fairly large valley. It's a sprawling, two-story house, white wood with ferns hanging off the wraparound porch. It looks like something from To Kill a Mockingbird. And I'm immediately sending John screenshots like, Dude, we have got to stay here. He texts back, equally enthused. He does point out, however, that the place has no reviews. Now, in my book, this is an Airbnb no-no. But the place seems cool, and it's so cheap and... Well, what can I say? I was feeling spontaneous. So I booked it. Strict cancellation policy be damned. I mean, you can't beat $15 per person. <laughs> we would play rock, paper, scissors to see who got the bed when we got there. A couple of weeks go by and the day of our trip finally arrives. We both get off work at four and meet up, already packed and ready to go. We knew that the trip from Tampa to Sequatchie would take about eight hours, so we didn't waste any time getting on the interstate. Honestly, the drive up there was pretty uneventful, so I'll spare you the details. By the time we make it into Tennessee, it's approaching midnight. When we get off the interstate and head towards the address, it's dark. It doesn't get this dark in Tampa. 
Apparently the town of Sequachi isn't overly concerned with things like streetlights. The cell service finally dwindled to nothing, about 15 minutes after getting off the interstate. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But John was smart enough to get a screenshot of the route beforehand, so it wouldn't be lost. <laughs> Five-star wingman there, ladies and gentlemen. We navigate some serious back roads, eventually leaving the pavement behind for a long, gravel driveway. It didn't stick out at the time as much as it does in retrospect, but the mailbox was actually lying on the ground, causing us to miss the turn on the first pass. Only after getting out in the pitch darkness and examining the fading address stickers by the light of John's phone did we determine that we were indeed on the right track. We continue up the driveway, if not with a little more skepticism than before. It winds on for, I shit you not, twelve minutes through some mountainous territory. At times the grade became serious enough that I thought I might have to put my forerunner into four-wheel drive. We finally come around a bend in the drive that opens up onto a large field. In the distance, I see the house briefly as my high beams swing across it during the turn. I think that was the first time that I really became concerned that something wasn't right. In the brief seconds that my headlights illuminated the house, it was obvious that the pictures had been deceiving. It was without a doubt the same house, but it clearly hadn't been cared for in some time. Half of the shutters were hanging off haphazardly. The white paint was dirty and chipping. The ferns from the picture had long since withered away. My car continues the turn, and the house is once again obscured by darkness, as we make our way around the perimeter of the field in front of it. I remember John saying something along the lines of, What the fuck have you gotten us into? as we pulled to a stop in front of a massive old willow tree that served as the end of the driveway. It looked like some ancient sentinel in the semi-darkness. The house stands about thirty yards away from the end of the drive. I notice, with relief, that it does have electricity. At the side door there's one of those old-fashioned yellow light bulbs casting a sickish glow onto the surrounding bushes and the sidewalk leading to the driveway. I turn off the car and try to lighten the mood by saying something my grandfather always used to say. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. John casts me a sideways glance and smirks. <laughs> we could leave, find a Motel 6, or just take turns driving. At this point, my creep meter was quietly pinging at around 6 out of 10. Just on the threshold of uncomfortable but not quite there yet. Definitely not Motel 6 uncomfortable. Oh, come on, John. Where's your sense of adventure? I say as I swing my door open and hop out. My feet make a scrunch sound as they meet the gravel, and I'm immediately struck by how loud the sound of the summer bugs is. We grab our backpacks and pillows and make our way down a very old sidewalk toward that yellow light. For some reason, it reminds me of a hospital. The instruction said check in whenever. The key will be under the mat. John stoops and lifts a corner of the ancient mat. Underneath is a skeleton key, roughly the length of my hand. Pretty cool. He stands up with it, and we just sort of stare at each other for a second. The door has a large, frosted window and we can see that it's pitch black inside. He shakes his head at me and sticks the key in the lock. The deadbolt makes an ungodfully loud ka-chunk sound that, I swear, echoes. I reach past John and push the door inward. The air that blows out as the door opens is stale. It smells like air that has been sitting still since the Paleozoic era. Now, I need to be clear that it doesn't stink. It's just thick with the smell of disuse, if that makes sense. 
John gestures for me to go first. So I do. If I'm being honest, I think at this point my creep meter had probably edged up to a seven. Still quiet, but now a more pronounced pulse. Still not a Motel 6 uncomfortable, but the place just felt so empty. I shine my cell phone light around in front of me as John follows me through the door. We are in a large kitchen, huge even. He gently eases the door shut. Every footstep sounds like a squeaky explosion on the weathered hardwood, and John shushes me as I make my way towards the counter on the other side of the room. I can see a piece of printer paper illuminated there. My stomach drops as I get closer. Now, you're going to think I'm making this up, but I swear to God, it's a piece of printer paper with the words Make Yourself at Home, scrawled on it in blue crayon. And it looks like it was written by a toddler. Each letter is blocky, crooked, and two inches tall. I turn and look at John as he begins to read it over my shoulder. And I immediately recognize his nope the fuck out of here expression. His eyes are huge. Dude, what the fuck? Dude, what the Fuck. He's looking over my shoulder now. I snap my head around in the direction of his gaze. What? What is it? He's looking out of a huge window. Through it, the tree line is dimly illuminated in the hazy yellow glow from the bulb outside the door. I just saw something moving out there. I swear, just past the edge of the woods. I strain my eyes, but see only the trees and their shifting shadows. It seems like the wind is picking up. If the crayon hadn't done it, John's outburst had. I was officially Motel 6 uncomfortable. Oh, let's get out of here. You're right, we can find another place to stay. Sleeping in the car would be better than this. John is a hundred percent on board. We make our way out of the kitchen and let the door slam, no longer worrying about being quiet. I'm actually jogging by the time we get halfway down the sidewalk, my backpack bouncing awkwardly. John beats me back to the car, and I see his shoulders slump as he slows down. What? I ask, and then I see. The tires. All four tires are completely flat. That's when the screaming started. Martin! Martin! Company's here! John and I were both frozen in place. Our eyes locked together. We had both been so transfixed by the discovery of the flat tires that the sound of this woman's frantic shouts had put us into a kind of terrified stupor. Marion! My stomach felt like a twisted knot. John was facing away from the house, and over his shoulder I could see what appeared to be an old woman in a white nightshirt. She was barefoot and pacing along the edge of the woods near where we had just come from, barely visible in the edge of the dim yellow light. My eyes widened as she leaned towards the trees and raised her hands to her mouth. Martin! Martin, it's time! John found his voice. Shit, shit, shit. Sean, what's she doing? What is she doing out here in the middle of the night? Shh. We need to be quiet. We had both ducked behind the car, but I doubted that she'd be able to see us out here in the darkness anyway. I peeped over the hood toward the sounds. She was walking rapidly back and forth, slightly hunched over, 
staring into the dark trees. We must have run right by her on our way back to the car without even noticing. The thought of her lurking in the shadows while we hurried out of the house sent a chill down my spine. Just as I thought this, she screamed once more, her voice cracking with the strain. She paused for just a moment, as if listening, and then disappeared into the woods. The old lady literally just ran into the dark woods. No flashlight, no shoes. The sound of the night insects seemed to swell in the absence of her screams. Have you ever been in an extremely high-pressure situation? The adrenaline rush really does make it feel like time slows down. In the moment of surreality, two facts pushed themselves to the front of my mind, bright red and almost tangible. We had lost cell service miles before reaching the house. Driving out of here in our car was not an option. The tires weren't just low. The rims were resting on the gravel driveway. That wouldn't work. No, sir. We wouldn't get ten feet. John seemed to have reached a similar conclusion, and raised a fantastic counterpoint. Hey, I bet they have a phone in there. Like, a house phone. <laughs> Old people love landlines. True, but I saw one glaring issue. Yeah, I really don't want to go back inside. We don't even know that it's empty. She could be back any time, I said. I noticed a pickup truck parked near a dilapidated shed near the other side of the house. It looked ancient and rusted, but all the tires seemed to be full of air. Potential. Let's go check that truck for keys. John nodded, and I was already running, dropping my backpack as I took off. I wasn't sure who Martin was, and I wanted things to stay that way. We cleared the yard in fifteen seconds and the house had now obscured our view of the woods where the old woman had disappeared. I jerked the handle, and it swung open with a groan. John was on the passenger side and already had his cell phone light on. Together we searched for the keys, above the visors, in the cup holders, every nook and cranny. We found nothing. As neither of us knew how to hotwire a car, we needed a new plan. Okay, I said. I vote we run for it. John opened his mouth to protest, and I talked louder. You saw that lady. She's completely batshit. She slashed our fucking tires, and now she's running to get help. She could come back any time. I know, I know, John said. But you have to remember, we basically drove up a mountain to get here. And I don't remember seeing a single car after we got off the interstate. It could be hours before we find somebody, and that nut job could just run us down in a truck. Hmm, a good point. The prospect of wandering in the dark for hours loomed ominously. So, I relented. Fine, but we have to go now if we're going. And then, we were running again, aiming for that sickish yellow glow near the kitchen door, the air rushing past my ears. As we got closer, I could see the spot where the woman had run into the trees. Nothing there but darkness now. Despite our rush, we paused for a moment outside the door to peer through the frosted glass. Still pitch black dark. I took a deep breath and pushed the door in, and again we were met with the smell of air that had been sitting still for ages. The kitchen seemed to yawn backwards into deeper darkness, and my cell phone light swept over the countertops in search of a phone or a cord. John checked the other side, and we met near the back wall. Nothing, I whispered. John nodded his consensus. 
Outside the window that faced the woods, I saw only the empty yard and the dark tree line, shifting in the breeze. Let's check one more room, and then we get the fuck out of here. The door out of the kitchen opened onto a long hallway. The other end of it was just visible at the edge of my flashlight's beam. My heartbeat pounded in my ears, and I whirled my legs forward with considerable effort. I got to the end of the hallway and stopped. John bumped into me, and actually pushed me further into the room. I leaned back to try and escape from what I was seeing, but it did no good. I felt like my legs were about to give out. Every wall was covered in thick, black writing. Symbols I had never seen before. Symbols that I had seen before. My name. But one word stuck out. Written on the floor. Written on the damn ceiling in that same childlike scroll. And then I was screaming. And John was screaming. And as I began to voice the word run, I realized that a third voice had joined the cacophony. Her ancient gray face was pressed against the window. Black eyes darting back and forth as she cackled. Our eyes met, and she was laughing and screaming and foaming at the mouth. Oh, God. Martin. He's coming. Martin is coming. And she was sobbing and laughing and screaming. Oh, God help us. And her face was twisted in glee and agony as she smashed it through the window and kept screaming as the blood began to flow. Martin is here! He's here! And my legs were moving, and the breath left my lungs in gasps and spurts as I followed John back through the kitchen door and into the yard, and, oh God, why was it so bright out here in the middle of the night? We ran down the drive and into the woods, and we ran until we couldn't run any more, and then we ran some more. John, shaking me. The sun was shining. A truck. A truck was coming. Got to get up. The fog lifted a bit, and I saw John running towards the road with his arms out. The kid looked seventeen at most. I heard him say he had a room, and I stumbled out of the culvert in which I had apparently been lying. The clock on the dash said seven, twelve. When the police got there, the house was on fire, and had already burned most of the way down. When John and I recounted the story, they reacted with visible skepticism. I can't blame them, really. Nothing unusual at the scene. Definitely no bodies. I still don't know who that old lady was. Or Martin, for that matter. They told us that the house had been abandoned for as long as they could remember. We're both fine, for the most part. All that is to say is, be careful when using Airbnb. Most of the ones that have a few decent reviews are probably safe, but...
B&B, eh? You never know exactly what you're going to get, but make sure you trust those ratings, and don't go for something that doesn't even have a star next to it. <laughs> or you may end up in trouble like our protagonist this evening. It's only a story, just try and remember that. Well, that's 25 minutes of me you've had this evening, and for those of you for whom that isn't quite enough, I've tagged another story onto the end of this video. Now, it, thematically, it's pretty similar to the one you just listened to, but it is an old one, and you might have heard it before. Nonetheless, I'd be delighted if you'd stick around another 15 minutes. Okay? You ready? Right, here we go. People are strange. When you're a stranger, faces look ugly when you're alone. Famous words from a famous song. And also very, very true. People are strange. And sometimes faces look ugly even when there are other people there to share in the awe and the horror. Sometimes it's best just to get out of a place as fast as you can. As we'll see in tonight's true story. Sit back and relax everyone with your favorite drink because now it's time to listen. When I was in college, I got a great job delivering furniture for this well-established mom and pop operation. This was the late 90s, so there was no background check, no drug test or anything like that. My dorm mate, Daniel, had gotten a job there with me the same day, so it was pretty rad. I'm not a very private person, but I think everyone has some inherent amount of nosiness about them. Delivering furniture to people includes the bizarre social contracts wherein complete strangers ask other complete strangers to come into their home. I remember, after my very first day of work, being astounded by just how much crazy I had witnessed. And the creepiest part is that it wasn't some big guy or some sideshow freak. It was a little old lady. So, my first delivery was a very expensive, very heavy bedroom set. A chest of drawers, a dresser with a big mirror and top set, and two nightstands. We got everything loaded on the truck and made sure we had the address and owner's name, Ms. Nettie Carroll, and we headed out. My college was in an area that consisted of three to four mid-sized cities, surrounded by many smaller rural towns. This delivery was going to a town I'd heard of, but had never visited. <laughs> this was before any of us had access to Google Maps, so we grabbed the map out of the glove box and hit the road. We left the city and started getting into the more rural area. Lots of trailers, Lots of dilapidated older homes. Extreme poverty on the outskirts. We finally reached the address for the county road where the house was located and saw that it was, apparently, at the end of a very long driveway. It was around noon in the middle of the Alabama summer, so it was oppressively hot outside. When we reached the bend at the end of the driveway, we saw that, inexplicably, there was a gorgeous Victorian-style home. My co-worker said, Well, this doesn't belong here. I approached the house and knocked on the door. I waited. Nothing. I knocked again and gave it a 30 count before realizing that there was an old-school metal door knocker. You know, the kind with the metal plate and ring that you lift and then bang against the frame. Eventually, I heard the door's lock disengage. And there stood a little old lady, probably about five feet tall, a perfect little puffball of white hair on her head, 
wearing a blue and yellow floral print dress. I didn't say anything at first because I was literally unable to comprehend what I was seeing on her face. She had on gobs and gobs of pasty peach colored makeup, bright red lipstick and blue eyeshadow. It was literally caked on. It looked as though she'd used upward strokes on her eyeshadow because it gave her face an expression of perpetual surprise. I would later in the day describe to my drinking buddies in my dorm as it <laughs> looked like she put that shit on with a shotgun. And my God, the perfume. She had on so much that standing away from her doorway about three or four feet, I could taste it. In smaller doses, it might have smelled like green apples, but the volume that she'd chosen to wear gave it a poisonous smell, not unlike insecticide. Eventually, I was able to say something along the lines of, um, I, I'm here to deliver your bedroom set. I found I was able to carry on if I pretended to have something very important to look at on my delivery sheet instead of looking at the lady. Now, I'm a big guy, 6'1 and around 235 pounds. I played football in school, grew up rough and so on. But this little old woman terrified the living shit out of me. And shit was about to get much, much weirder. She welcomed us. Daniel, I found, had come up to the house and was looking at the little old lady with a look of absolute astonishment. And she opened the door to an immaculately decorated anteroom with a thick red and gold oriental rug. There were exposed beams on the ceiling, beautiful, old brass fixtures, the whole nine yards. She said, y'all can come right through here and then wind around the sitting room there and just bring it all back to the main bedroom. The whole time she was very flirty, very coquettish. Daniel and I went into the back of the delivery truck and exchanged, what the fucks? And did you see? Before trying to get our shit together, long enough to load the dresser on the dolly. We got back to the front porch and found that the door was standing open. So we eased the dresser through the front door and waited in the sitting room with the dresser on the dolly. As we stood there, it dawned on me that I had anticipated coming into the house and cooling off. But it was just as hot inside the house as it was outside, around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Daniel was whispering around the edge of the dresser. Man, this is jacked up. This poor old woman is fucking crazy. When I whispered back, do you hear that? He stopped, half cocked his head to the side, and then said, No, what is it? I said, Really? Listen. Dun, 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 Sounds like a xylophone. <laughs> you don't hear that. Fed up with me, Daniel said, Dude, what the fuck are you even saying? <laughs> Wait, I do hear it. About that time, Ms. Carroll came back into the front of the house and said, All right. I've gotten everything moved about for you strapping gentlemen. Which she followed up with this creepy, girlish giggle. We followed her through the sitting room with the dresser on the dolly, carefully dodging all manner of expensive looking heirloom furniture and knick-knack. As he backed down the hall, Daniel leaned around the dresser again and whispered, Getting louder! I realized he was right, and it was definitely a xylophone. We stopped outside a massive bedroom with similarly expensive looking decor and set the dresser up on end. I was looking at the doorframe, considering how best to get the dresser into the room, 
when it dawned on me why I recognised the music coming down the hallway. Here, in the house of this creepy little old lady who lived in a million dollar home, out in the woods with no air conditioning, I was hearing the unmistakable hook from the song Girls by the Beastie Boys. What the actual fuck? For some reason, this actually broke the hair on the back of your neck feeling I'd had since arriving, <laughs> and I had to chuckle. But that was to be a short-lived break. Ms. Carroll squeezed past us and back up the hall with a ooh, tight squeeze, and Daniel and I had a good laugh while we were getting the dresser moved into the room and up against the wall. When we finished moving it, we fastened the mirror onto the top and went back to the truck. To Ms. Carroll I said, So, is the rest of this going into the same bedroom? To which she replied, No, the two nightstands and the chest of drawers would be going down the hall. I resisted the urge to say, you mean the Beastie Boys room? And Daniel and I went to the truck. We loaded the chest of drawers on the big dolly and the two nightstands on the smaller one, then went back inside. Once we got to the end of the hall, I noticed that the other bedroom door was open and Ms. Carroll was standing in the hallway. She cooed. Right this way, boys. All of that is going in here. I was pushing the smaller dolly with the two nightstands, so I rounded the corner first and realized two things almost immediately. Number one, my name that tune skills are right on. And number two, hey, so there's a mostly naked girl laying across the bed. No, really. The girl looked to be in her mid to late twenties, and she was laying perpendicular across the bed in a bikini, sound asleep. True to form, Girls by the Beastie Boys was blaring from her CD player. I realized we'd been hearing it for over an hour, and that it had to have been playing on repeat. Ms. Carroll finally seemed to notice the girl and said, Misty, cover yourself. Then she looked at me with that fantastically horrifying makeup on her face and winked. At some point, I realized that I was rushing as fast as I could to get out of there, and Daniel seemed to be doing the same. We got the chest of drawers put together in record time, all the while sweating like crazy because there was no air conditioning at all. As we were finishing, Misty apparently had enough. She sat up, eyes closed, and yelled, I'm trying to fucking sleep. I told you I didn't even want that shit in here, Nettie. Not Grandmama, not Granny, not Mama, but Nettie, Misty still with her eyes closed, rolled over and went soundly to sleep. This sent Nettie into a rage. She starts yelling in this shrill, high-pitched scream. You can get out of my house, you filthy cocksucker! And on and on and on. Horrible, horrible name-calling. Accusations and the like. Just a complete 180 from the sweet little old southern lady with the scary makeup into this foul-mouthed, shrieking monster. <laughs> At some point, I backed her all the way against the far wall of the room, and I found myself with nowhere left to go. Just when I thought things were about to go to psycho overdrive, Daniel calmly and politely chimes in. 
Uh, where would you like this nightstand? Without taking a breath, Ms. Cow replied. Oh, right over there on the far side of the bed, if you don't mind. Thank you. We quickly had her sign the paperwork and hightailed it out of there. As I was going back out of the front drive, Daniel said, Hit it, dude. I swear to God, Leatherface is going to come busting out of that front door any minute now. <laughs>